Is it? Is it that time again already? What have you got for me? Sam says, hey guys, not sure if this is the right way to go about asking questions, but here goes. Long time fan of the show, how much would gravity affect an insect or arachnid if it was climbing up, of a, up a tall building? Are they so small that it's negligible because of their tiny microscopic hairs? Well, let's just take an arachnid, Sam. Bib -bla -bla -bib -bla. If a spider's climbing up something like a building, their spider peats are so small that they have tiny, tiny, tiny nanoscale hairs on the end of those peats. And they are so small they can interact with intramolecular forces in between atoms and molecules, these small partial plus and minus charges that can attract and repel certain things. The spider peats are so small on the end of those tiny hairs that they can be attracted to these different partial forces and therefore stick to the side of something like a wall. This is also what geckos do with their lizard peats. So this is not necessarily affected in the situation that you are talking about. Gravity, at least the amount of gravity that we feel, remains more or less constant all the way up until further than the International Space Station is orbiting at. I think they still uh, experience over 90% of the gravity that we do all the way up there in the International Space Station. So on a tall, tall building, the same amount of gravity is affecting these spiders, so their ability to cling to a side of a building would be just about the same. What they want to worry about more is on the side of a building, there would be a lot of wind loading. There might be high velocity winds up there, and then their tiny peats might not be able to hold on as strongly in the face of those mighty, mighty winds. But that's a pretty good one, bib bib bibbly. Thanks. Welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all your comments, questions, and corrections, and perhaps look at them a bit too closely. Yes. And I apply the magnifying glass of objectivity and science to them. And then I tell you what's going up next on the Because Science channel. Hint, haha, <laughs> woo! It doesn't have Will Smith in it, but Will Smith is in it, but not in it. But it's about him. But getting right down to it, in the last episode of Because Science, we were trying to figure out whether or not uh, ye olde magnifying glass would destroy Ant-Man completely. Just a normal magnifying glass that you could buy just about anywhere. I said that if Ant-Man retains his Ant-Man mass when he is very small, you would not be able to use something like this to vaporize him. But what did you have to say? There's actually a distance where the, uh, because of the optics, I should flip upside down. Because of optics, I got an upside down mouth. <laughs> Hippie hair, j I take that personally. Hippie hair, Justin Garcia, Samuel Covington, Benton, Markham, uh, they all say something like, could a larger magnifying glass than what we considered, which is this exact mi uh, magnifying glass, would a larger one be able to burn Ant-Man more quickly? Yes. Definitely. If you had a uh, much larger surface area to concentrate more of the sun's power down to a small point, you would be able to get more power on the surface of Ant-Man and raise his temperature more quickly. However, as we said in the episode, the hottest that point can get, the focal point, that tiny image of the sun from something like this, the hottest that can get is the heat of the source, or the temperature of the source, rather. So that's the surface of the sun itself, 5,500 degrees Celsius. Very, very, very hot. And Samuel Cummings and Bentham uh, go on to ask, well, what if you were to maybe come up with some kind of system of magnifying glasses and lenses and you could chain them all together to focus down the point smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller? Could you make this point so much hotter, as hot as you wanted to get it? No. Actually, because of thermodynamics, thermodynamics basically says, if you're talking about it very generally, that there's no such thing as a free lunch in the universe. You can't just get free increased energy. You have to put some energy in. So even if you had a magnifying glass and then a magnifying and then another, 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 another in a chain that made something really, really hot, if the end point was hotter than the source and these lenses aren't adding any extra energy to it, you are just bending the light, then you're getting free energy from the universe. And the universe does not want to do that. It's like a used car salesman. And if you could do something like that, that means you could create a perpetual motion device, a free energy machine, and you could violate all thermodynamics. As far as we know, that's super impossible. So no, you would not be able to daisy chain a number of magnifying glasses together to get a point as hot as you wanted, but you could use a larger magnifying glass to get Ant-Man closer to the surface temperature of the sun, and that would definitely do some damage. <sighs> <sighs> Mini Bees asked, would Tony Stark break his finger flicking Ant-Man? Huh. Well, if Ant-Man kept his man mass when he was very, very small, let's just say he's something like a, you know, small nubbin on the ground, and, but he was still, you know, 175 pounds or so, you know, 70 kilograms, what have you. If you flicked it, 
he probably wouldn't move as much as, say, you know, a marble that is, you know, the same size but a lot uh, less mass. Let's just say that that doesn't move at all. Ant-Man doesn't move at all when you flick it. Would you break your finger? Eh, I don't know. Go flick a stair. Go flick a concrete stair edge and flick it as hard as you can and see if your finger breaks. Don't do that. My point being is that even if Ant-Man was completely immobile and you could not move him because he was so massive, I don't know if you'd break your finger. I think that has more to do with how hard you can actually flick your finger on something. And if you have a sibling, you can use their forehead to find out. Our next comment is kind of along the same lines. It comes from United We Stand, who says, if we had a big enough magnifying glass, we could melt steel. Oh, oh yeah. Like I said in the episode, no known material on Earth can withstand surface of the sun temperatures for very long. Everything will melt. And if you look at this clip from a James May show that he did uh, a while ago, he goes to a series of mirrors that are set up to create an incredibly hot focal point, And you see uh, that it can melt a lot of stuff. It can turn a hot dog into a hot dog. Ugh. But it can also, it can melt through steel. Yep, you're absolutely right. And in the original video that we used, it melts a steel bolt like it's nothing. So yeah, magnifying glasses can get pretty dang scary. And that's also the reason why you don't want to look at the sun, but we'll get to that in a second. Daniel Carr asks, if you did vaporize Ant-Man, wouldn't there be an absolutely gnarly explosion? I, I can't do all the math, but all that co water content expanding rapidly, assuming you did it like a second, I guess there would be a bunch of tiny, super dense bone bullets flying everywhere? Oh yeah, this sounds absolutely terrible. I didn't even think about this. If you vaporize 70 kilograms of water in a second, it would rapidly expand, you know, by over a thousand times in volume very, very quickly. And I got to assume that's crazy dangerous. Like I wouldn't want it in my face. Hmm, it's hard to say exactly what that would do, but if you've ever watched Mythbusters, as I have, you've seen what happens when uh, the boys... <laughs> <laughs> the boys heated up all the water in a water heater until a lot of it was vapor and then all that vapor uh, released itself at once and propelled the water heater to like 500, 800 feet into the sky. It was a gargantuan amount of energy. So you can see that there's, we're talking about similar things here. If you vaporized many kilograms of water, it would release a tremendous amount of energy all at once if it was under a second and that might be potentially dangerous. Good point. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I got to give to to Midori Lopez, who says, hey Kyle, love the show. Thank you. <laughs> and she says, I've always had this question. What would happen to Ant-Man if he fell from a high building? I mean, ants will survive, but humans, not so much. So I've talked about this a few times, especially on our live streams, but animals, as they get less massive, they get smaller terminal velocities. So the reason why an ant or even a mouse can fall from just about any height without splatting is because their terminal velocity is dictated by when their weight force on the surface of the earth is canceled out by a drag force. And if they're moving through the air, they're going to have drag on their bodies. But if they don't weigh very much, then it's not going to take very much drag. And so they can stop accelerating under earth's gravity very quickly, leading to a small terminal velocity. So when ants hit the ground, they're not going very fast, not much force in their body, and they survive. However, if Ant-Man retains his maybe 75 kilograms of mass, but stays the size of an ant that we are considering, I plugged in his surface area, the drag coefficient for a human falling through the air and his mass and under Earth's gravity, and I get a terminal velocity of Mach 77. So Ant-Man, if he was falling unimpeded and all of our assumptions about how his powers actually work are correct, he would stop falling at Mach 77, which is 59,000 miles per hour. And when he hit the ground, he did. Good point. And for pointing all that out and making me do some math, you, Midori, are indeed a super nerd. Let's find it. <laughs> there it is. But of course, I'm not always right. I thought I could take the Valkyrie Queen in God of War uh, normally like a champion, but I had to turn it down to easy difficulty. Not proud of that. Our first correction comes from Motocat, who says that uh, according to the Marvel Cinematic Universe on Pym Particles, Ant-Man removes all of his mass and throws it into a different part of the universe somehow so he doesn't have all the problems that we often point out with Ant-Man. And so if he was super tiny and had super tiny mass, you would indeed vaporize him with one of these. I agree. And we pointed that out in the episode that if Ant-Man had ant mass, then you could vaporize him like you may have done to ants. 
and now regret. But I think the powers, even in the MCU, no matter what the Wicca says, Wicca? Wicca man? No matter what the MCU wiki says, I still think that Ant-Man's powers are portrayed confusingly in the MCU. Specifically, he interacts with things and has objects affect him in a way that implies very often that he still has man mass, like throwing a toy train with just his bare hands. An ant still wouldn't be able to do that, even though ants are strong for their size. Or, you know, punching a guy when he is small and having it react like the guy got punched by a full grown man. That is different. It implies that he has a lot of mass but then two seconds in the same scene, he's running along the top of the guy's gun. Wouldn't the guy, you know, feel the weight? I don't know. So it really depends on the interpretation you want to go with. That's why I offered two. If he was Ant-Man mass, then you could not vaporize him very easily. If he had ant mass, then yes, you could vaporize him. The choice I leave to you. The correction, though, to this episode that had the most of you commenting uh, came from Ben Wardell, Tim Nim Anderson, Double Negative, etc., who say something like this. I said, and XKCD says, that's the reference I was making, but I said that you cannot make a fire with a magnifying glass like we did in the episode from Moonlight. All of you were saying, basically, that because the moon reflects sunlight, when it is reflected, it should be the same as sunlight otherwise, and that when it gets to your magnifying glass, you can just magnify that sunlight and you should be able to make fire. This is not true. There's a huge difference in the light that is coming off of the moon. For example, to make the sun as dim as moonlight, full moonlight on Earth, you would have to push it back 500 times further away from Earth than it is now. 500 AU, about 69 light hours. Nice. So when the sunlight bounces off the moon, it's not exactly the same as normal sunlight as we interpret it. It is much less intense. And because of that, you cannot concentrate it down to a point that is nearly as hot. And if you think about how hot it possibly could be, like we said, it's the temperature of the source. And how hot are moon rocks? Well, not hot enough to burn the astronauts' boots that stepped on it. So we know from that principle alone, that you would not be able to get fire from Moonlight. Ultimus Dragon has another correction who says, uh, I'm glad you told me to get adult supervision to use a ruler. I had almost forgot last time I put an eye out. <laughs> yes, uh, you're being very funny, but Serious point, why don't you wanna look at the sun? Why is it dangerous to look directly at the sun? Well, this I think is uh, illustrated very well by the principle of magnification that we're going through. So this magnifying glass that we used in the episode has a concentration factor of a little over 1500. And as you can see in the episode, it could ignite the stuff in asphalt and it easily burn through paper. Very dangerous when you magnify the sun down to a point. Now, the concentration factor of the lens in your eye is 2,500. 2,500 versus 1,500. Now imagine what it does to the back of your eye when you look at the sun. It does something worse than this does to the paper you saw burn in the episode. So that is why you don't want to look at the sun, because of the principles learned herein. There, hitherto, unjust. Art thou. <laughs> oh, Samim has a quick correction who says, hey, Deadpool actually used a magnifying glass to kill Ant-Man before. I said in the episode that I did not know of any situation where someone actually used a magnifying glass against Ant-Man, and that is just not the case. In Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe Again, Volume 4, there is a single panel where Deadpool basically ignites and vaporizes Ant-Man with a magnifying glass, so it's happened, and I'm wrong, and... Yep, oh, ah. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to Shreyansh Anchilla, who says, hey, you do not consider the factor that color, spelled with a fancy British U, would also matter. If you calculated with Ant-Man wearing black color suit, it would be possible. But for red suit, the time might be much more, more than double. Yep, I experimented it myself. Well. Yep, I think you're also correct. Now, like a car will get hotter if it has an all black interior or it's all black on the outside versus all white. Ant-Man's suit would have a lot to do with what wavelengths of visible light are absorbed, how quickly he heats up. He could, if he wanted to, and he knew that a vaporization by magnifying glass was a big worry, he could change to an all white suit, like ghost suit in Ant-Man and the Wasp, and it would make it much harder, at least a little bit harder, uh, for him to be vaporized by a magnifying glass. So, for getting all of that, yep, you are indeed a super nerd. Ah! 
Just thinking about the ants. Now, moving right along to this week's episode. This week's episode of Because Science is just how powerful is the Men in Black's noisy cricket? <laughs> That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, uh, I'm going all the way back to one of my favorite movies as a kid. Well, I mean, when I was a kid and not trapped in here in Immortal, but Men in Black. Specifically, I want to do some math with all of you to see just how crazy strong the noisy cricket, the famous weapon from the original Men in Black movie, I want to see how crazy strong that would actually have to be to throw a grown fresh prince. Yes, a prince all the way across the room with a tiny, tiny gun. You won't believe how nutso this gun is, but for all that, you'll have to see it. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science Yet all about Ant-Man and what it would take to vaporize him with a magnifying glass. And leave me all of your nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and the Twitter. And don't forget, if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. That's a, that must have been a big fish. But if you teach a man to fish, he will maybe, on his first cast, accidentally hook the back of his neck with a hook. Ouch.